John F. Kennedy was assassinated November 22, 1963. It is still a subject of controversy. Gary Shaw, author of the book Cover Up, examines the evidence concerning the John Kennedy assassination tonight on Alternative Views. Kennedy assassination buffs out there, we're going to replay our interview with the assassination theorist Gary Shaw that we taped two years ago. We also are going to play the Zapruder film that actually recorded the Kennedy assassination and we'll provide an analysis of that and an update on more recent assassination theorists, theories concerning JFK's assassination. But first we'll have some updated news stories. I have something from the Village Voice, one of my favorite writers, editorial writers today, Pete Hamill. And he, uh, he gets cranked up about the NRA's uh, recent move to put, shove a, a, a new bill through Congress lessening controls on guns. Oh, it's the they, National Rifle Association. The NRA, right, National Rifle Association. They, re, they recently succeeded in doing just that. And this despite the opposition of uh, virtually every police department. And this includes things like uh, buying and selling guns across state lines and this new plastic gun, which supposedly can escape detection in airport uh, terminals. So it's uh, called a terrorist special or a hijacker helper is another term I've heard recently. And uh, Pete Hamill gets all worked up like he usually does, which is why I like him. And he comes out with some great statistics. Now, these aren't new, but they're very interesting. Uh, in 1980, according to Handgun Control Incorporated, 77 people were killed by handguns in Japan, which has about half of our population. Eight died in Great Britain, 24 in Switzerland, eight in Canada, 23 in Israel, 18 in Sweden, and four in Australia. In the United States, 11,522. Wow. It's uh, another thing I heard just a couple of years ago is there, there are more murders in Houston every year than there are in all of Western Europe. And now we have the NRA uh, pushing for less stringent controls. Well, as Hamill says, the International Association of Police Chiefs and 13 other organizations for the police lobbied hard against this so-called Volker, Volkmer NRA bill weakening the gun laws. But they simply didn't have the bribe money to spread around that the NRA has at its, at its disposal. The NRA admits to spending a million and a half on its ad campaign supporting this bill. And last year alone, the NRA laid out $1.4 million in campaign contributions to our, as he says, incorruptible congressman. And as he says, also, grease works. I saw the coverage of this uh, bill, some of the debates on it in Congress on uh, C-SPAN, and it was unbelievable what the NRA and the Volkmer bill wanted to allow. For instance, uh, you didn't have to do hardly any registering for handguns or other um, weapons, plus they made it legal to have silencers on your gun without having to register them, and also would allow something now forbidden, which is a home silencer kit to be built so that you could uh, build your own uh, silencer. I don't know what else a uh, silencer would be good for except for assassinations. Plus it made it uh, legal to do customizing work on your guns, like to build uh, sawed-off shotguns and any other number of innovations that you could use for uh, violent uh, crimes. So in other words, they wanted to do away with all regulation whatsoever of guns. In the last few minutes, some amendments came on that stopped some of the most outrageous 
of these uh, changes that the NRA and the Volkmer Bureau wanted to put through. But still, uh, just about anything goes. So the police chiefs called this uh, the professional crime bill because they were the chief uh, beneficiaries of uh, this new gun bill. Yeah, but somebody's got to kill them commies. <laughs> <laughs> Making a lot of headlines around the country has been the activity of Lyndon LaRouche and his candidates who were sprinkled around the country and particularly after they got their notable success up in Chicago. But it hadn't been mentioned about the what the Christian right-wing people are doing to the GOP around the country, particularly as Ronald Reagan's presidency is fading and he isn't going to be around for another, uh, for, for another term. Well, these fundamentalist Christians are organizing and they're trying to take away some of these positions which the regular GOP folks have been holding all this time and it's beginning to worry the, the regular GOP stalwarts. The right wing has its own particular agenda, the far right, and they're very disappointed because Reagan hasn't been following this. And the people like the doles of the party and the that clown who's the vice president, what's his name? I never remember his name. George Bush. <laughs> George Bush, that's right. Anyway, they, they don't like him, and so they're starting to run their candidates all around the country, and they've got a lot of money, too. The state GOP establishment charges in various places that the rise of the religious right is alienating potential adherents. I might also note that Pat Robertson of the Christian Broadcasting Network has been getting a lot of publicity in his run for president. So he's going to go after someone like uh, Bush from the right and maybe uh, even run as an independent and siphon votes off from the Republican uh, candidate. So after seeing the left and the Democrats tear themselves apart over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, we may have a similar spectacle emerging on the uh, right. Now let's go back to 1981 and the program we did on the Kennedy assassination. Here is an article which, if you ever get a chance to read a back issue of the Rolling Stones, this is May 20th, 1976, the title of which the Hughes-Nixon-Lansky connection, the secret alliances of the CIA from World War II to Watergate. It's a mind-blowing article, about 20 pages long, but it shows the interrelationships, continuous interrelationships with the CIA, the Mafia, and the United States government, specifically presidents and also the State Department. It shows the CIA involved very heavily in the United States domestic politics. It shows them contributing to campaigns. It shows them feeding information to favored politicians shows them laundering money for politicians. It also shows the relationships with Howard Hughes, the Mafia, the CIA once again, the Defense Department, and presidents. For instance, it shows that Nixon was very heavily involved with the Mafia. And it shows even starting back in World War II when Roosevelt got the Mafia started involved with in relationships with the CIA. And Thomas E. Dewey, the same way. He was prosecuting the Mafia on one hand and he was helping them out on the other. You see the manipulation of the press by the CIA. And people all during this period keep popping up again and again. People with the, uh, in the Bay of Pigs situation, the Kennedy assassination, the um, plumbers in Watergate, all popping up again and again. And this article from the 76 issue, May 20th, 76 of Rolling Stone, gives people a good background to understand the Kennedy assassination. You have some updated theories on it. Well, you know? there's been two uh, books published uh, in recent years that give new uh, theories of what happened in the Kennedy assassination. One is that the mob, in conjunction with the FBI and the CIA, um, assassinated uh, Kennedy. According to this book, the mob had blackmail information on Kennedy on one of his love affairs with some mob um, um, woman they had uh, tape recordings and pictures on. So they used this to try to blackmail Kennedy to try to keep him from coming down on mob activities. However, Robert Kennedy, who was attorney general, was out to get the mob and harder than any previous uh, attorney general uh, persecuted or came after the mob. And an angry mob therefore decided that they had to get rid of uh, Kennedy. So that was one uh, conspiracy theory. 
Another is not really a conspiracy theory, but it analyzes what happened to Kennedy's body from the time it left Dallas to the time it came to uh, Washington and showed that some bizarre uh, events went on. First of all, there's the empty uh, coffin uh, theory, that the coffin that was supposed to have claim, uh, contained Kennedy's uh, body that people saw um, go on the airplane in, um, wa in Dallas turned out to be empty when it was opened in uh, Washington, which suggests that Kennedy's body was removed for some sort of surgery or cosmetic um, uh, operation from the time it uh, came to Washington to the time it was finally, uh, he was finally uh, buried and before it was also inspected for the, uh, the uh, post-mortem um, analysis that was the basis of the one um, bullet theory. Well, according to this analysis, the uh, body was made up to show that there were not more uh, bullet wounds, but rather that it was used to support the one bullet uh, theory. Well, Doug, let's take a look at the Zapruder films, which actually show Kennedy being hit and show these wounds, and show him being wounded. The By more than one bullet, apparently. And also coming from the front, right. as well as from the rear. The following film footage was compiled by Robert Groden, a well-known critic of the Warren Commission report. This shows the Kennedy limousine as it is going down Main Street in Dallas. Now the presidential car is making the turn onto Houston Street. The president is seated in the rear of the car on the right. Governor Connolly is sitting directly in front of the president. The limousine will be making the turn onto Elm Street shortly. This is the famous Abraham Zapruder film of the Kennedy assassination. As the president's limousine emerges from behind the sign, it's obvious he has been struck by a bullet. He slumps forward, and then the fatal headshot. Now here is blow-ups of just the president in the Zapruder film. Again, as he passes the sign, he's obviously been hit, and then the fatal headshot. The president's reaction to the headshot can be seen more clearly with these enlargements. Notice that as the president is struck by the fatal headshot, his body is driven violently backwards. Now let's delve more deeply into the Kennedy assassination with our 1979 interview with author Gary Shaw. Very honored and privileged to have a man who has devoted the last 15 years to the research of the Kennedy assassination, um, Mr. Gary Shaw. He's also the author of the book Cover Up. When he provides a lot of photographs and in-depth, in excuse me, detail analysis of the Kennedy assassination. And without too much further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Gary. Thank you very much, Al. It's a privilege for me to be here. Uh, as most of you know, uh, presently in the halls of Congress, there's a new investigation into the death of President John Kennedy, a murder that occurred uh, 15 years ago this month. A murder, I think, that affected all of our lives uh, in one way or another, and, and uh, one that uh, there's still many, many questions about. It's a murder and a, and a death that will not go away, and uh, so I've devoted a lot of my time and, uh, into my own investigation into the death of the President simply because when the Warren Report was issued in 1964, I began to have questions and doubts about their conclusions and began to compile information, talk to witnesses, uh, accumulate photographs and things of this nature, and, and soon uh, discovered uh, that uh, when, especially when the 26 volumes of allegedly supporting evidence to the Warren Report's conclusions was issued, that the only trouble with the Warren Report was that they forgot to underline where they lied to us about the President's death. One of the things that's recently come out, and I think it's very important to know the, the attitude of, of the investigation of those 15 years ago, is a memorandum. Uh, this memorandum is from the 90,000-page FBI release, which uh, came out uh, about last spring. This is a memorandum dated three days after the president was dead, November 25, 1963. 
It was to uh, Mr. Moyers, the new president, John Ke uh, Lyndon Johnson's chief aide. It's from Mr. Katzenbach, the deputy attorney general. And I'll read it verbatim. It begins, it is important that all of the facts surrounding President Kennedy's assassination be made public in a way that will satisfy people in the United States and abroad that all the facts have been told and then that a statement to this effect be made now. The public must be satisfied that Oswald was the assassin, that he did not have Confederates who are still at large, and that the evidence was such that he would have been convicted at a trial. Speculation about Oswald's motivation ought to be cut off. So there was a cover-up <clears throat> from the very beginning. From the very beginning, they had determined that Oswald was the assassin, the lone assassin. He had no Confederates, and that any speculation otherwise should be cut off immediately. What was the date of the memorandum again, Gary? November 25, 1963, mm. three days after the president died. So they had a conclusion three days afterwards. That's correct. Why do you suppose? Well, uh, of course, you're getting, uh, you're getting me to speculate, which I don't mind doing. Uh, the, uh, one of the chapters in the book is called Speculation, Who Killed Kennedy? And it's my contention that uh, the people responsible for the president's death are a government in itself within these United States of America and uh, that they're still in power. They liked what they got in 1963. They're determined to keep it. And if necessary, they'll kill again and again and again. Which they have done. Which they have done. Hmm. You have some, uh, uh, well, that new film. Let's talk about that. Okay. There's something that just came out just the past few days, and you say you have actually seen it. Yes. The uh, new suppressed film. To give the people a little uh, in-depth uh, on, uh, on the new film that's been much publicized uh, beginning this past <laughs> Sunday, uh, a copyrighted story in the Dallas Morning News of, of last Sunday talked about a man named Charles Bronson who had been in Dealey Plaza on the day of the assassination and took a very important piece of uh, movie film as well as some steel slides. Uh, this information had been classified about this film until this year. And so when, uh, when this came into the hands of a private researcher in uh, uh, in, in the north, northern area. It was sent down to one of us in this area, and uh, it was turned over then to uh, Earl Golds, the reporter, a very fine investigative uh, reporter for the Dallas Morning News, who in turn traced Mr. Bronson down. He had since retired from his employment of that time and uh, viewed for the first time the film. Uh, the importance of the film and the slide is, is really twofold. The film itself, uh, actually photographs the president while he's under fire from an opposite opposite position to the famous Zapruder position. So you get a little uh, bit different uh, perspective of that. In other words, well, he was on the other side of the street. That's right. So the, the bullets were coming uh, from the right. grassy knoll over Zapruder's head. Right. But they were actually going, going toward, toward... This gentleman, Mr. Wow. Bronson. Okay, now he was a distance away, but uh, about five minutes prior to the, to the arrival of the president in Dealey Plaza, he panned his camera on uh, to an ambulance who had arrived in the Dealey Plaza area to pick up uh, an epileptic who had had a seizure right there on the corner five minutes before the motorcade. We've always speculated that it was, this was a diversion because the man got out uh, of the ambulance at Parkland Hospital and walked away without any treatment. But uh, anyway, he filmed this ambulance. Fortunately, he had his uh, lens on wide angle and was able to photograph the sixth floor uh, windows of the Texas School Book Depository. Shall we look Five at minutes. some of that? Yes. Okay, let me get over to this. Uh, now, this is not a camera here. Of Bronson's no. uh, film. It's a. But this uh, does show the. Uh, the okay. photograph of the depository. Uh, actually, this was about 30 seconds after the shot, so it's a very pertinent photograph that was also classified until uh, about 12 years ago. This wow. was taken by an Army intelligence agent who happened to be in Dealey Plaza and taking pictures. Okay, which is the building? This is okay. the. Uh, alleged sniper's nest or where Oswald was uh, supposedly fired the shots yeah. that killed the president. It's in this window that Mr. Bronson's film catches a man in a red shirt. You can see him moving back and forth in front of this window. Oswald was not in a red shirt. That's correct. Next to that, in this group of windows, and that, by the way, the entire sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository was a ware room. There were no partitions. And so uh, in this window, 
a person can be seen or an object. Uh, in, in other words, there's simultaneous movement in this window and this window in the, uh, in the Bronson film. Uh, there is even the possibility of a third movement in one of the windows. So, but, but basically, definitely, there are two movements here at the same time. And this definitely supports the theory that Oswald was a patsy and possibly they were afraid he might chicken out at the last minute uh, and so they went up there with him or something to that effect, possibly? Well, well definitely it, it proves that uh, that there were two men on the sixth floor mm -hmm. at the time of the shots. Well, there's uh, whether either one of them were Oswald is, is yeah. a question mark because we now have an eyewitness who told the FBI that day that she saw Oswald at 12.25, five minutes before the assassination in the lunchroom. And they didn't give that information. They didn't even print it and did not give it to the Warren Commission. Because how can a man uh, be uh, in the lunchroom at 1225, the president is shot at 1230, and at 1225 there's already one man in the, in the window and one man in the next window. And then when uh, Officer Baker and uh, Roy Truly, the supervisor of the Texas School Book Depository, race into the School Book Depository after the shots were fired, within two minutes they find Oswald in the lunchroom. And our speculation is he never left the lunchroom. Mm -hmm. He was there all the time. And uh, that's where he said he was. Well, there's and something I've noticed from those, those photographs, Gary, and that's that there are an awful lot of open windows in that building. Is that significant? I think it is, especially uh, in this southeast corner, uh, or actually the southwest corner window. These, these two windows are fully open. Uh, one of the eyewitnesses in Dealey Plaza said that there were two men seen in this window down here, one of them with a rifle. And uh, I believe that one of the shots was fired from this particular window here. Now, we have three eyewitnesses plus the movie film that says that two men were on the sixth floor of the school book depository. This could possibly be the shot that hit him in the throat? Uh, I believe it's the shot that hit him in the back. In the back, uh -huh. right, that came out his throat. Right. Well, there are some uh, indications that uh, the bullet could not have been fired from even up in this depository window because it was at a because the uh, entrance of the wound and all the path of the wound in Kennedy was at such an angle where it could not have been shot, shot from that. From that window. That's uh, correct. I mean, no, there's so a lot of speculation. It's that reason that I speculate that that there was a shot fired from that window, but it was strictly for diversion and evidentiary purposes only. It was a planned shot to call attention. It was the first shot. It struck absolutely nothing. It was fired simply to call attention to that window, mm. and even a last shot was fired from there, and the eyewitness said the man lingered at the window as if to admire his handiwork. Mm -hmm. I believe he wanted to be seen in that window. And oh. this was shown by the new movie? The, was it? No, not not uh, the man lingering in oh, the window. Oh, I see. This I, was prior. I hope I'm not jumping the gun, but don't you have a picture of the wound uh, <clears throat> produced in Kennedy? Uh, all right. Well, this is... Uh, Commission Exhibit Number 388 that the Warren uh, Commission published in their in their book and uh, shows the uh, president. It's an artist's conception. By the way, the artist never saw the president's body, nor did he see any photographs of the president's. These were described to him, and uh, they do not anywhere near match the description given by the Parkland Hospital doctors in attendance uh, that day. This is absolutely incredible. But they bent the president's head. Contrary to what the film show, the, the president is erect uh, at the time of the shooting. Contrary to what that shows, they bent the president over in this position, uh, distortedly, uh, to show the angle of the shot so that it would come from the sixth floor mm. Texas School Book Depository. One other thing I'd like to point out about Mr. Bronson, uh, he uh, not only had a movie camera, but he had a very fine slide camera, or, or steel camera, and he took a very important slide. He said he his finger uh, depressed the button on his slide uh, uh, camera at the exact moment of the, of the shot. Mm. And so at that time we have a, a very good perspective then from the opposite view to Zapruder's of the first shots. Do, we have, do you have a copy of I that? I do not or? have a copy of that. Mm. But uh, in that, and, and this is the FBI memorandum about Bronson, I got this under Freedom of Information. So this is dated oh. November 25th, 1963. Describes Bronson's film, where they say it's not of value. <laughs> but they also said one of the 35 millimeter color slides depicted a female wearing a brown coat taking pictures from an angle which would have undoubtedly included the Texas School Book Depository building in the background of her pictures. Her pictures evidently were taken just as the president was shot 
approximately five other individuals in the photo were taking pictures at that time. This, I think, is important because the FBI has denied uh, to me, under Freedom of Information, that they have uh, this film uh, in their possession. And yet, in this uh, slide, you can see uh, this is right after the shots were fired. There are people already lying down and, and, uh, and moving away. But here is the lady in the brown coat that they're talking about. She's got her camera. Uh, in the Zapruder film, you can actually see her, and uh, she pans the, the entire assassination scene. Uh, shortly after that, this photographer caught her on the opposite side of, uh, of Elm Street. Okay, her camera is, is in her oh. hand. Yeah. And uh, this lady, we looked for her. We knew about her for quite a few years, but we looked for her, and, and uh, I stumbled on her in 1970 oh, and interviewed her for the first time and got the story of her movie. She took the movie uh, all during the assassination. She was a camera bug. She was 18 years old at the time. She uh, took the movie and at that time was working right next door, coincidentally, to uh, Jack Ruby's Colony Club. Wow. She uh, took her film back to, the, to the, uh, her place of employment and uh, the next day, before she had even developed it, two men who identified themselves to her as either Secret Service or FBI agents said, we understand that you took a film of the president's assassination. And uh, she said that she did. They said, we'd like to, to have it. Uh, she said, I've not developed it yet. She said, and they said, well, we'll develop it for you, make copies and return the original to you. Uh, so they took her film. She's not seen the film since that day. I filed under Freedom of Information with the Secret Service, with the FBI, and with the CIA. All of them deny uh, existence of this particular film, yet the FBI admits uh, that they knew of her uh, in November 25th, 1963. Did you file with the Mafia? I haven't correct? filed yeah. with the Mafia. <laughs> That's the only one left. <laughs> well, my speculation is, is that uh, there were individuals in the Dealey Plaza area using fake Secret Service credentials. This is uh, a proven fact. And uh, it would not surprise me at all if she went back next door to Ruby's Club where she uh, communicated and were friends with Jack Ruby's employees and was bragging uh, about having taken a film of the assassination. The word got around. And so we have two more fake Secret Service or FBI agents who come and confiscate the film and it's never been seen. Or it was possibly confiscated by the FBI. And it, like the Bronson film, other photographs that I could tell you about if we had the time, have been classified and kept away from the American people for all these years. Well, what about this new committee uh, in Congress? Is that going to be another whitewash cover-up? Kind of looks that way. Unfortunately, it appears that, uh, that it will be another whitewash. They're using uh, basically the same tainted evidence that uh, that the Warren Commission used to, to come up with their conclusions. Including the same tainted witnesses. Uh, the same tainted witnesses. Uh, that's uh, the same investigatory techniques where they're asking the FBI and the CIA and the Secret Service uh, about what they did. And I doubt very seriously that the FBI is going to tell the truth if they made an error. Well, they haven't yet. Right. They've, <laughs> they've, they've destroyed evidence. They've doctored evidence. They, they put in a couple of frames of the Zapruder film backwards, backwards so it would look like he was shot from the back instead of from the front. Right. Well, I'll tell you another That's one. That's just one man of many, many things. We found out recently about another set of photographs taken by a man by the name of Robert Croft. He was standing... Uh, in a uh, in a position directly across from the school book depository. Do you have a you have a picture of the whole setup from the air? Do you not? Yes, I do. Maybe we could uh, put that on the screen and uh, so that everybody would be able to orient themselves. Okay, let me see if I can get that. Okay, that's the an aerial view of Dealey Plaza. And, okay, and, uh, and the route was what? Now? The route came down uh, this street right here. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, this street, which is Main Street, yeah. and made a uh, right-hand turn going due north. Mm -hmm. The school book depository is here, so the, yeah. the motorcade was going directly at it. Then it made a 120-degree angle turn. Now, this turn was very strategic because this made this an ideal assassination setup because the car, car had to slow to a very slow rate of speed as it made this 120 degree angle turn. That was against Secret Service That's regulations. Against the regulations. Right? Having open windows in a building nearby was also against That's Secret correct. Service regulations too, right? But Mr. Croft was standing at this position right here. 
directly across from the school book depository. Mr. Zapruder was, was here. By the way, uh, Mr. Bronson was right here. Oh, so, he was quite some distance away. Right, well, about a half a block is all. Yeah. But anyway, Mr. Croft took four photographs. He took one uh, from this position and then ran to this position and took one as the presidential motorcade came around the corner. And then he said, I took one exactly at the time of the shots. The first shot was fired. Mm -hmm. So here's another one that would have been taken looking at the grassy knoll. Which is? Which is this area right in yeah. here. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, the FBI got his film and developed, them, uh, developed it themselves. <laughs> and out of a 32-row film, uh, he took four shots of the assassination, uh, or the, the motorcade. Three of them turned out perfect. The one taken at the time of the shots, after the FBI got through with it, came out blank. And that was the uh, only very, one in the whole row. That's that right, the only one on the whole row that came out blank. What, what, what do you speculate is the FBI's role in this? Uh, some people are kind of torn between whether they're actually involved in this in an overt fashion or whether or not they're just simply a bunch of bunglers. What's your personal opinion, Gary? Well, my personal opinion is that there are some people in the FBI who were not bumblers, that it was a pre-planned, uh, need-to-know basis, and that they participated in the cover-up. And this applies, the facts. this applies to the Secret Service as well? That's right. Uh, I've noticed that Fletcher Prouty has also made similar accusations over the last few years. Of course, we used to all think he was nuts, but a lot of the things that he said have come it's true come also. I, I want to I stress, you know, I, we need the FBI and we need the Secret Service, and we need the CIA. What we don't need is a few in these organizations who think they know best how to run this country. Right. Now, the CIA right. has admitted that they've used Mafia hitmen for a number of years. Right. And particularly in the 50s, they tried to use Mafia hitmen to get Castro in Cuba, so it's not implausible that they um, uh, helped out with pe members of the Lansky, Traficani gang, Salvatore Giacani, John Roselli, uh, by the way, the last two, which have been, <clears throat> well, they, they, they've died recently under rather um, mysterious circumstances. Uh, would you care to comment, though, on some of the accusations about the involvement of the mafia with the Dallas police? That's very interesting because in a recent article in Dallas uh, Times News, Dallas Morning News, uh, just kind of a throw-off sentence, the author said, it's been well known for years that the Dallas police has been infiltrated by the mafia. Well, I think probably there are uh, corrupt policemen, you know, in the Dallas police as well as in the sheriff's department uh, at that time and, and uh, more than likely still are. Uh, there was a mafia connection to Dealey Plaza, and a lot of people uh, are not aware of this. A man by the name of Jim Braden was arrested a few minutes after the assassination under mysterious circumstances. Excuse me. I, that is, that's the same Jim Braden who is a charter member of La Casa Country Club, and had no visible means of support, and uh, had a private jet and a few other... Well, other at, that, at that time, <clears throat> he wasn't quite that well off. Right. <laughs> uh, at that time, he was uh, uh, on parole. He was in Dallas. Uh, he said, allegedly, on oil business. Uh, one thing he had done, about uh, two months prior to the assassination, he had changed his name. And it became Jim Braden. His real name was Hale Eugene Brady. And he changed it only in September of 1963, prior to coming to Dallas. Right. On the oil connection you mentioned, it, it <clears throat> should be noted that it has been documented through records that this Braden uh, did meet with members of the Hunt Oil Company group in particular. I think either Nelson Bunker or Lamar Hunt, even though they initially denied it, that they knew him, uh, his secretary had kept a record of uh, Braden's visit to uh, one of the Hunt brothers. That's right. Uh, he, he, in fact, met with, uh, with at the Hunt uh, offices on November 21st, 1963. This it was this Braden? day that uh, Jack Ruby also went to the Hunt offices for, for some mysterious reason. This is Mr. Braden here, and I'm sorry I don't have a good clear... Uh, See, maybe we can get it over here. Yeah. You mean Jack Ruby met with um, Braden? Uh, well, at least well, Jack Ruby was at the same place with Braden in the Hunt Brothers' offices. That's correct. Now Braden stayed at the Cabana Hotel. It's now changed its name, but that was a was a hotel in Dallas that was built with Teamster funds. And uh, on uh, November 21st, 1963, that night, Jack Ruby also goes to the Cabana. Hmm. Now I can't say that he met with Jim Braden, but it's strange that Jim Braden was arrested in Dealey Plaza, gave false identification, had an FBI rap sheet of arrest four pages long, and yet was immediately released by the by the Dallas authorities, and uh, only because he had to sign a, an affidavit of what he was doing there did we know about him, and, and it took years to trace him down. 
But that's a mafia connection, uh, as well as a connection to uh, the uh, labor, Jimmy Hoffa, because uh, of the... Uh, he later on became a charter member of the La Costa Country Club in Southern California. Uh, it's a 2,000-acre spa, and it was financed by Hoffa's Teamster Funds. And Central States Teamsters Funds. Right. Fund. And uh, so it's just one of the strange arrests. There were actually about 13 or 14 arrests made that day in connection with this. All of them were very, very strange. And, and uh, uh, for instance, the arrests uh, behind the uh, fence area above the grassy knoll of three men. Allegedly, tramps were told. Uh, the, the the funny part about these three men, they were marched in front of the school book depository. They were hiding in boxcars, taken into custody. The, by the way, the J Dallas uh, County Jail, the Sheriff's Department, is directly across the street from Dealey Plaza, so they didn't have far to go. But one of the things missing from the National Archives is the arrest records for November 22, 1963. So we don't know who these men are. We have their photographs, and there's been ten tentative identification over the years, and uh, maybe we'll have more light on it uh, in days and weeks ahead. Well, you have some real good uh, blow-ups of the uh, scene here, of the assassination scene. Are those from the Zapruder films, or are they from uh, other sources? That's these two photographs right here. The first yeah. one I'll show you. Uh, this was taken by, again, a, an amateur photographer uh, in Daly Plaza. This first one was taken at almost the instant of the first shot. Here you can see the president right over this uh, patrolman's shoulder. And uh, if you look right up here on the little uh, concrete wall, you can see Abraham Zapruder and his secretary. Oh. Zapruder filmed his famous motion picture. So it's a good, clear view. And there you can get a good idea of the perspective of a man that distance from the president. Uh, this photograph is very important because of right down at the end of this little old white wall, there is a man standing. Now even the new committee had to admit that this was a man standing behind the wall and that there is a long object sticking upward uh, out of his hand and a good possibility that it was a rifle. Now that's well, that just before the shot. Just, just, before just at the time of the first shots. So. I'd like to add this for the benefit of those out there watching this on their TVs. Um, I personally didn't know whether to believe this particular part of it or not until you see the photos close up. Uh, the photos close up uh, definitely show a man standing at the end of the wall. Well, even with their uh, image enhancement and uh, their sophisticated techniques, they have had to admit and on a, on a photograph immediately following that, taken by the same photographer, you can see very quickly that at the end of the wall, there's no longer a man there. And this was taken right after that, few this seconds. This within six seconds. Mm -hmm. Six seconds. Now, even that wouldn't be conclusive, except more than 50 of the Dealey Plaza eyewitnesses said that shots were fired from this position that day. We've either got affidavits, or uh, the Warren Commission himself had 47 of them on record, but we managed to find 10 or 15 others that they didn't find who what? said the shots. Seven men saw a puff of smoke or a flash of light. One lady who was standing across the street uh, in, in this area right in here from this position said she saw a man in an overcoat and, uh, and a hat run from that area quickly after the shots were fired. The policemen jumped off of uh, their motorcycles and ran to this area. All of the people, the witnesses, ran to this area looking for it. Yeah, you can and see it's it. behind this area that uh, four uh, men encountered men with uh, Secret Service identification, which later on the Warren Commission even had to admit that there were no Secret Service agents in Dealey Plaza after the shots were fired. Right, and you can clearly see from the photographs that most of the eyewitnesses are looking at the grassy knoll area. And this is right after the, the president has been shot. They're not looking at the president. They're looking at the grassy knoll area as opposed to the... Uh, school book depository building. Right, and I might point out too, this is William E. Newman and his wife and two children. Mr. Newman told the Warren Commission and told authorities that day. Now, he was a Korean War veteran, by the way. And he said, I hit the deck. The shots were coming right over my head. Now, and yet the Warren Commission ignored him. either ignored them or, right. or never considered any, they any never of considered the... Uh, they, yeah. they had to ignore it. What they couldn't uh, explain away, they ignored. What they couldn't ignore and explain away, they destroyed or suppressed. Well, let's look at another piece of evidence that they um, they ignored, and the bullet. This is the same bullet that supposedly went through uh, John F. Kennedy, the seat, after making its miraculous 90-degree turns. It also went through John Connolly and came out 
through his wrist and into his thigh, was it, or hit his thigh? That's correct. This has been termed a, the famous miracle bullet. Uh, this is a copper-clad uh, lead core uh, bullet. This one is the one that uh, the Warren Commission said went through President Kennedy from the back, exited his throat, uh, went from there, uh, and because of the Zapruder film, we can tell when John, John Connolly was wounded, uh, so the bullet had to pause about a second and a half to, to three seconds, uh, depending on when you want to say he was hit. He was definitely not hit at the same time. Right, that's our, that's our smart bullet. So we've got a delay, plus it has to make a uh, right turn downward and then a left turn to enter the, the governor uh, just below the right shoulder blade. It goes through his chest, blasts out four inches of his fifth rib, exits his chest, uh, goes through his right wrist, uh, blasts out the main bone of his right wrist, exits, exits again, and penetrates his left thigh, where it works itself free, wipes itself off of any blood and tissue, <laughs> uh, crawls over onto another stretcher, totally independent of either of the two uh, victims that day, and uh, becomes the link to Oswald's Mandlicker Carcano rifle. Maybe, maybe this bullet bullets. came from outer space. Mm -hmm. so. right. You have some pictures of bullets in your book, don't you, that we can use for a comparison to, yeah. to the Wonder Bullet? And these are believed bullets uh, that were fired through a, a cadaver and also in a goat. And the okay, this is the bullet that I just showed you. This is another uh, photograph of it. This is a bullet of the same caliber, fired from the same rifle, and fired into the wrist only of a cadaver. And you can see the mutilated point. Uh, this other is, a, is one bullet. It, it came into two pieces. It was fired through the, ri the rib of a goat. And so you can see what actually happens to this type of bullet when it comes in contact with a human being. This is the single most damning piece of evidence, is it not? That's right. This will not go away. This will not get buried. You can't, you can't, you know, snuff it out like they've done with so many people involved with this thing. In fact, the Warren Commission counsel said that to say that Governor Connolly and John Kennedy were not hit by the same bullet, this miracle bullet, is synonymous with saying that there was another assassin firing that day. And that's my contention. The overwhelming evidence is that there were more than one rifleman in Dealey Plaza that day. What are some of the other pictures and evidence that you have? Well, I like to talk about this gentleman right here uh, because this information only came out with a CIA release of their Kennedy material uh, about two years ago. Under, under Freedom of Information, uh, a document from the CIA came out about a man by the name of John Swetra, a Frenchman, a member of the OAS. Uh, the OAS, by the way, is the secret organization that tried 28 times to assassinate uh, French Premier Charles de Gaulle in the late 50s and, and early 60s. Uh, Mr. Swetra had two aliases, Michael Rowe, R-O-U-X, and uh, uh, Michael Hertz. Uh, Mr. Swetcher was a soldier of fortune, uh, an assassin, uh, a, a man who spoke French, uh, of course, eloquently. He, he spoke English with no accent at all, Spanish with no accent at all. In other words, he was a linguist. This uh, CIA document says Mr. Swetcher was in Fort Worth on the morning of November 22, 1963. This is the time that the president was speaking at the, uh, at the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce banquet. Uh, he was in Dallas at the time of the assassination, and the document says he was flown out of this country on orders from people uh, high in this government in the United States of America. Uh, we talked to the FBI agent who uh, uh, originally got on to Mr. Uh, Swetra, uh, and uh, when he uh, was in Houston, and uh, this uh, FBI agent said that Mr. Swetra either knew who killed Kennedy or he himself had killed him. And yet these documents were classified for 14 years. Uh, it was only in recently under Freedom of Information. I have presently a Freedom of Information suit with the uh, Central Intelligence Agency as well as the FBI who have now had to admit that this man exists and that documents pertaining to them are in their files. And uh, yet it'll probably be another year before I'm able to re receive those documents if I get them. At all at that time. The Freedom of Information Act has been very important, has it not? Because uh, listening to a Mark Lane speech, it definitely proves now that Oswald was working with the FBI, that Ruby was an FBI agent, and that each of them had uh, some.
connection with the CIA and that uh, Ruby also had uh, mafia connections. Right. Uh, I doubt very seriously if we'll have this Freedom of Information Act very much longer. The talk is now <laughs> that the uh, Freedom of Information is allowing organized crime to get information and that they're combining and are accumulating information from this Freedom of Information Act. Therefore, we need to, to shut it off. So uh, I look for that in the very near future, probably before I get my documents on Mr. Swetra. By the way, it's too lengthy to go into, uh, probably, but Mr. Swetra also has a, uh, a strange connection to, uh, to Mr. Ruby, uh, oddly enough, oh. uh, through another man who uh, died uh, in 1973, I believe, uh, in Texas, a gun runner uh, that was close friends and who uh, Ruby very definitely wanted to conceal the information about from the Warren Commission. Strange. Okay, what are some other things you have here? You well, I think we've shown there? about all of the, mm -hmm. the photographs and so forth. Uh, but tell us about, now you appeared with the committee uh, before they actually got started. Were you a consultant? Or they, uh, no. You helped set it up? Or? And that's a long story. At one time, the committee, I believe, was really and truly seeking to know the truth. Particularly uh, the staff. That's right. And, and in fact, uh, immediately after they were funded, uh, two of the investigators came to the Dallas Fort Worth area, contacted me, and spent four hours uh, with me on uh, various aspects of the case. This was back when Richard Sprague this was, was when the Richard prosecutor, Sprague, and we had right. the first chance in history of really breaking the thing wide open. But I think even then, the, the powers that be saw the handwriting on the wall and, and began to uh, cause division. Uh, within the committee, within the staff, within the congressmen who were participating in it. Henry Gonzalez. Right, and got Henry Gonzalez and Richard Sprague butting heads. And mm. uh, so, uh, unfortunately, we had the resignation of Gonzalez and then the resignation of Sprague, and, and now we have uh, Chief Counsel uh, G. Robert Blakey, uh, a professor who uh, is now, uh, I believe, the most active participant in the new cover-up or the new whitewash that's being applied to the case. And I predict that the conclusions will be just from what we've seen. In fact, they began to write the report in March of this year, so that ought to tell you something, before they had any public hearings, any public testimony. And they already had the report drafted. So they're going to say, I'm sure, that Lee Harvey Oswald fired all the shots, uh, that he did it from the sixth floor window, that the wounds and ballistics were correct, as the Warren Commission stated, and uh, that the FBI did do a poor job uh, in investigating, and that the CIA didn't do a very good job, and the Warren Commission was flawed because of uh, the information that was given them and, and this sort of thing. But basically, the conclusion will be the same. Yeah. Let's go back and talk about motive for, for a minute, Gary, because in any murder case, the detective always looks for, for a motive. Uh, to me, it seems that a motive was clearly there for the CIA to be implicated in this since Robert Kennedy, I mean, uh, Jack Kennedy had not only uh, put the CIA down, but he had also tried to dismantle the overt, covert operation group. He had fired Alan Dulles as the head of the CIA a few months prior to his being assassinated. Robert Kennedy had been putting known members of the mafiosa in jail left and right, from Giacana to Roselli, uh, and he was he was stepping up the whole organized crime uh, strike force attack on the mafia. Uh, would you care to comment anything about the motives for, for these various agencies and groups sure. and, and, and syndicates? Uh, the central point uh, of this whole thing is Cuba. Uh, Cuba, you, you look at it, off of that is the CIA, which had uh, formed a task force uh, against Cuba. They were attempting to assassinate Fidel Castro. They had hired organized crime members to, to actually hit Castro. Right. And not Organized all... crime had been run out of Cuba. Right. Lansky and his, his organization, and, and from what we've been, we've been told, uh, but they had a lot of money buried on the island, and one of the motives, of course, was to recapture some of the money, and plus their, their gambling casino base. That's correct. Uh, so you have that kind of uh, central theme. It's Cuba. And for, uh, for that reason, a lot of people think that, uh, that Castro, because of uh, the attempts on his life, that he retaliated by killing Kennedy. That's not so at all. Mr. Kennedy was... Uh, was actively uh, investigating organized crime. Joseph Felici at that time was squealing his lungs out uh, before a, a congressional committee. Right, and this embarrassed the FBI to no end because uh, throughout the existence of the FBI prior to this, um, 
um, <clears throat> Jagger Hoover uh, denied the existence of the mafia. That's it's, correct. It's, been, it's come out since then that he he, um, he used to meet, meet regularly with Frank Costello. Right. Uh, a known member of the organized Well, he crime denied thing. the existence of it, and when he finally had to admit it, he gave it a name called the Cosa Nostra. Right. Uh, he wouldn't call it mafia. His, uh, didn't some of his underlings found this name to help him save face? Right. It's as if he just discovered this all of a sudden. That's right. Um, well, there's another aspect of the uh, Kennedy thing, too, in relation to Castro, and that he was, <clears throat> Kennedy was carrying on uh, secret, secret indirect uh, negotiations to try to normalize relationship with Castro, too. And he was wanting to dismantle the CIA. There. What about the uh, Nixon uh, connection and, and the uh, water, water, Watergate plumbers who were also in uh, Dallas at that time? Yeah, okay, the CIA was funding at that time a, a Cuban exile group called the, the Cuban Revolutionary Council. And this is another one of the strange ties because the man who, who was head of that group for uh, the government was E. Howard Hunt. And, of course, Nixon at that time was vice president. This was in the late 50s. Eisenhower was president. Nixon was vice president. He was in charge, and, and he had put E. Howard Hunt. This uh, Cuban Revolutionary Council had its offices at 544 Camp Street in New Orleans, Louisiana. It's at 544 Camp Street that Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, this is the address that he put on his fair play for Cuba leaflets that he was passing out in New Orleans in the summer months prior to the president's death in Dallas. So you've got E. Howard Hunt tied to the Cuban Revolutionary Council, and you've got Lee Harvey Oswald tied to it, and you've got Richard Nixon in charge of it. And then later on you have Watergate with Richard Nixon at the head. By the way, we've got a similar situation there. We were told it was one lone nut in Kennedy's case, and then later on we, we've got two lone nuts with, with Jack Ruby. Mm -hmm. Originally in the Watergate episode we were told that we had five lone nuts who right. broke into it. Then yeah, that five turned out to be seven, and uh, <laughs> then seven later turned out to be uh, all the way up to the administration. To the, actually, right, <laughs> right, where the head nut was found. So we're exposed. we're not uh, unacquainted with the lone nut theory, and so that's the Watergate connection. And uh, in my opinion, uh, Mr. Nixon uh, got into a position that the powers that be uh, did not like, and uh, they couldn't afford to. Uh, blow another one's brains out, so character assassination uh, was the next best thing, and, and I, I think that the whole thing was plotted and carried out uh, to uh, get us a president that we didn't elect and a vice president that we did not elect, and uh, unfortunately... It's, in it's interesting to note that Nixon was home free until Alexander Butterfield, who was the CIA agent, uh, walked in one day and just simply volunteered that he had um, the President of the United States on tape saying a lot of interesting things. That's correct. Well, what about the new information which the committee supposedly took a look at, the Congressional Committee, regarding the acoustics? Uh, re re both the reconstruction of the um, whole assassination for acoustic purposes and seeing how they would match up with the uh, uh, microphone being left on during and recording during the okay. uh, by a policeman during that the was a great piece of evidence properly properly utilized and a lot of people don't know this and so I'll give you the background on it during the time of the assassination a Dallas motorcycle patrolman at the exact moment of the shots and for about five minutes thereafter depressed his mic button while in Dealey Plaza well, we had always assumed uh, simply that that, that was uh, uh, blocking off communications from the area uh, for the for the authorities, and that that's all there was to it. But a man by the name of Gary Mack, who's a program director for uh, Z97 FM in in Fort Worth, said, "Look, if that man was in Dealey Plaza and he had his microphone open, there's a good possibility that the shots were recorded, even though they would be a, of a, of a low nature, and would have to have sophisticated techniques in which to uh, to bring them out." It's a good possibility. So he began analyzation with with uh, very sophisticated uh, electronic equipment and was able to pull out, in his opinion, seven shots. Seven shots. And uh, so uh, he wrote a story on it, and of course this got to the new committee, so they said, well, we better look into this too. So uh, they had a firm, that, in fact, the same firm that analyzed the Nixon uh, Watergate Gap tape. Uh, this firm, said that definitely they could hear four shots. Well, four is too many. You know, we're satisfied with four because that proves a conspiracy. And uh, so uh, they re then re retained this firm to perform sophisticated 
uh, tests in Dealey Plaza, and that uh, was much publicized. They actually fired shots again in, in Dealey Plaza, Dallas. I went there and uh, uh, witnessed this, and uh, uh, definitely you can tell the difference between a shot fired from the grassy knoll and one fired from the sixth floor window because they fired from both of these positions. And this firm again took these by, by placing the microphones in different positions and firing shots from the different locations and, and by their sophisticated electronic equipment, were able to say that there were four shots, again, from this recording. And they said uh, one of them did come from the grassy knoll. Now the committee is going to have, uh, have to and will uh, completely disregard this particular evidence. Either disregard or to try to find some excruciating way well, to... Well, they'll, they'll try to take the it. other evidence probably and manipulate it and say, well, we've got this other evidence and it's uh, the preponderance of the evidence uh, says that this is not so. Well, we have about 45 seconds. Can you give a summation of uh, what your opinion is of this whole affair? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it's very important that the people of Texas uh, convene a a grand jury and an and a inquiry here. Uh, it needs to be taken out of the political arena, uh, which is what it is in, in Washington. Uh, I said years and years ago that the Congress is, is not the place for an investigation into the death of the president, and that the only place, the president's death was not a federal crime in 1963. It was a murder under state statutes, and it ought to be treated as such because there's no statute of limitations on murder. and. Uh, if they would do it, get 12 tried and true men here in Texas, or, or people here in Texas, put them in a, in a jury box and bring the evidence to them, I believe they would reach the conclusions that uh, would bring uh, to justice the criminals who performed this act November 22, 1963. And that concludes Alternative Views. We're glad you could join us. Alternative Views is a presentation of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. If you have any questions or comments about the program, either comments in general or questions about the program you just saw, please write to us. Good night.